Hey everybody, welcome to the In All Things podcast. It's time to see God in everything. Uh, you are listening into a live recording of the In All Things podcast. For those of you that don't know, we record a weekly podcast here at our church with staff members and we talk about how we see God in all things that are happening in our lives and in the world around us. And so for the last few years, we've had what we call a live podcast here on the stage. In the last few years, Mitch and I have been on the stage, just the two of us, and we fielded questions that you submitted, and we talked about a wide variety of topics. But today we thought, let's do something a little bit different. Let's bring all four of us up here on the stage, and let's discuss something that we've been talking about for the last month, actually for the whole month of October. And we just completed a series called Dinner with Jesus. And during the series, you heard us talk about different times that Jesus had meals with people, and he was always on a mission with his meals. And so we thought it would be good for us to go a little bit deeper into that and talk about how in 2023 we can apply what we learned from the Bible, things that happened 2,000 years ago. So with that being said, I'm going to also uh, let you know that Mitch is going to lead our conversation, but Christy's going to go first because she has a fun icebreaker for us that the rest of us have no idea what it is. You don't even know if it's fun. I, well, I assume because you, liked, <laughs> you call yourself the director that of fun. That is true. So I assume that it's going to be fun. All right. Here's my question. I wanted to come up with something that had to do with dinner and eating and all the things. So my question is, you go to someone's house for dinner and they make something that you really don't like. Are you polite and eat it or what do you do? Eat it, 100%. I would eat the whole thing and then, or I would eat part of it and I'd find a way to cover up that I threw away most of it, um, but I would eat it for sure. I would eat it as well, but I immediately thought of that Seinfeld episode where they had mutton. <laughs> And they put it in that cloth uh, napkin and hid it in their pocket, and then they got attacked by a dog later. Um, I would not do that. That was a funny episode. But I actually, yeah, I would, I would struggle, drink as much water to wash it down, and try not to. Yeah, what would you do? Um, I think that's a great opportunity to pretend to be sick. I don't, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know. There's, a, there's, there's not many things that I just won't eat, but... Um, there's a few I can think of off the top of my head. So. Yeah, it helps not to be picky either. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a soup eater. What would you do? So. So you asked the question. Oh, I wouldn't eat it. I'm sorry. I would just hope that whoever <laughs> loved me enough to forgive me for not eating it because I am picky and it's mental and it would just not be good. So I would, I would just not eat it. I'm sorry. If you you ever, guys made me feel bad. See, like, I'm a people see, those of us you here, are, and you said you'd The four it, of us have shared hundreds of meals together over time. And so if you're ever going to invite... Christy or have dinner with Christy, you can um, let, let us know. We'll tell you exactly what to make to put her in an awkward situation. All right. So anyway, Mitch. So um, this morning, as Steve kind of said, we wanted to do something a little bit different. This is the third year that we've done um, this kind of live podcast idea. And so what we're going to do is this 930 service is kind of going to be part one. And 11 is going to be kind of part two of this conversation that we're going to have. And so for you all, um, that second part of the conversation is going to be available to watch or listen to at any or point this stay. week. Or you can stay. Yeah, if you want to do that, you can stay and be here extra long this morning. Uh, it's kind of a weird morning for us. But, um, and so the rest of these uh, wonderful people up here don't really know where we're going this morning. If you do listen to In All Things on a weekly basis, you know that that's kind of something that you guys like to hear is that it's not prepared, it's not scripted. Um, and so we're not up here with a big agenda or big plan or points that we're gonna get through. We're just gonna see where we land this morning. Uh, and we're gonna try to get through a conversation that is hopefully helpful uh, and, and uh, widens your perspective and, and the way that you can live out, like Steve said, some of the things we talked about this month um, here at Sycamore. And also, some of you noticed that Josiah just came and put these index cards on the coffee table. Uh, if you have listened to In All Things before, you're familiar with that Josiah has done this before. These are four words that he has written. We have no idea what they are. We're each going to pick up one. And at some point during the conversation this morning, we're going to work whatever word we get into one of our answers or one of the things we say. And also, somebody help me remember, at the end we need to reveal what words they were because we forgot to do that one time. So we're all going to pick an index card. This makes my stomach hurt worse, <laughs> worse than anything else in the podcast. And at some point, we're going to try to uh, work in... Oh, jeez. We're going to work in um, whatever our word or phrase is. So um, just to start us off this morning, we've, we've like you, you said, we've looked at multiple different occasions of Jesus sharing meals with different groups of people. 
And he had lots of different reasons for doing this, right? Sometimes he would leverage an awkward situation or an awkward moment to teach. Um, sometimes he would be like, you know, at a dinner with the Pharisees at a place where he wasn't necessarily supposed to be and he would leverage that situation to teach. Um, and sometimes he would just break bread with groups of people that you wouldn't expect him to be with, right? But the overarching idea is that at, at all these different meals and all these different situations, he was very intentional with, with what he was doing, right? Uh, as, as Jesus was with, with all of his life, but especially with meals and who he chose to be around, who he chose to be seen with. He was very intentional with, with why he did those things. And I don't know about you guys, but that's very different from um, how a lot of us operate when it comes to having meals or breaking bread with people. Um, and so maybe we'll just start there. What are some of the differences that you guys see between this way that Jesus handled himself at meals, which are very intentional. He did it for a reason. He leveraged awkward moments where he could kind of lean into it to the way maybe that a lot of us um, look and view at meals or, or times with people at, over a table where it's very rushed, it's very quick. So whoever wants to start, what are some differences you see between the way Jesus did it and the way we do it? Your phone's ringing. <laughs> So I think fast food obviously didn't exist back then. So as I was thinking about what we're going to talk about today, we know the, this general topic, but not knowing exactly where Mitch is going with it. But I think um, that um, back in those days, they, they more likely often had just two meals a day, like a morning meal and an evening meal. And uh, they were very slow about it. They weren't, it was no rush at all. And they didn't have the distractions that we have today. And so I think immediately, I mean, the first thought that comes to my, my mind is we don't slow down enough to really conversate like we should. Sometimes we do intentionally, but I would say more often than not, we don't. We're in a hurry. I agree with that. And they didn't have restaurants back then. That's like true. if you go to dinner with someone, you can't just sit there for two hours. They're not going to like that. So we have all the conveniences to get us out of those awkward situations because you know if you're going to a restaurant, you're probably going to be there an hour and need to get out. So I think that's a big difference too is we have all these ways that we don't have to have. We should be having those awkward things, but we don't. We're like, oh, there's an easier way out. And not only that, but even in our own homes and the way you prepare meals, everything's just gotten way faster, right? When you look at the Bible, when, when they would sit down and prepare a meal for somebody, it took time and a lot of effort to make what they were going to make. And now it's like, I'll just throw it in the air fryer and it'll be done in 15 minutes, right? Any air fryer fans they in here? Amazing, right? If they had an air fryer, they would have used it. Um, but even that, even the approach to having a meal or making a meal for somebody was so different, right? Because it took time and effort and energy and they couldn't just Google a recipe. Um, they had to just take time with it. And I think that says something to, you know, they were gonna put intention behind that because it took effort to even get to the meal, to have people over. And then, you know, I just think it was, the whole process was different. I don't know. Absolutely, I mean, I remember when my, you can talk to me. I'm good. All right, I remember when my grandmother and grandfather got the first microwave in our family. And it was like such a huge deal. And it was this huge thing. I had all these dials on it, you know. But I remember the idea of being able to just zap something in there very quick. And, and But I think we've microwaved our relationships a little bit. You know, they've become like how fast we have, you know, uh, meals in our freezer that our you know, kids know how to do. Like when they're young, they can put, put something in the microwave and cook their own macaroni and cheese or whatever and have their own thing so we don't have to bother to take the time do that because our lives have changed so much. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't honestly remember what I was going to say now that you uh, took over, but um, yeah, I think uh, I, just a glimpse, I think, into my life. I know with young kids, like you were just mentioning, like when we both get home from work, the last thing that I want to do or that Lisa K wants to do is spend an hour cooking, right? Like um, somebody said, First amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so. I don't necessarily know that in you know in our in our time today. Obviously, it, it's different. I think you know we look more towards as a family when we sit down for dinner. We look more towards that moment rather than the oh we're all in the kitchen cooking together because I don't cook. First of all, I I don't know how to even make a pop tart. So like if if it, when it comes down to it, um, it's it's just one or two people in the kitchen making a meal, and so that's not the personal time that we're looking forward to. So. When I think of uh, like Thanksgiving, for example, when everybody's in the kitchen or like all the, the ladies, all the moms are cooking and the dads are watching football and playing with the kids, those That's kind of stereotypes, sexist, right? Very sexist. Right, but, 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 uh, Not at our but, but those are the, the, like, I, I feel like, um, like for, for my, wi my wife, 
Like she looks forward to those moments where she's spending that intentional time preparing a meal with those that she loves rather, obviously rather than like 10 minutes making a sandwich right after, right, you know, right after we get home from work, those kind of things. So. It is personal too. I mean, it's not always like that. It's not always a woman, but like I love to cook, but don't have time to cook really. Cause that's how you're usually doing something. But when I do, when I have a week where like we're eating at home four days a week and everything's like good and edible, then I'm like, I am winning this game as a wife and a mom. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it varies person to person, right? Um, but I, I do think that's a great point, Jared, of, um, you know, maybe more so we value, hopefully, the time you actually share the meal or the moment together less than maybe the meal itself, right? And, and I, think, I think that it was that way in Jesus' day, too, um, at least with Jesus, right? He valued those moments with people. Um, but I, I think it, it still is a point to make that things are so busy, things are so rushed, like you just said, if, if I have one week where we're going to have four nights at home, right, um, you know, that, that's a win, um, and, and I think it just looks different for each stage of life, but what about you guys, um, you know, I hate to pull this card so early in the game, but you guys are older than me, so um, what, Thanks. you know, <laughs> um, growing up, what are some stories or times that you guys have where you remember, or were your families really big on what the dinner table was all about or you know maybe there there wasn't smartphones that you could pull out at the dinner table so maybe what are some things that you guys learned from those times um you know my my family yes we still had those moments but it was different you know my 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 older siblings had phones and i've just always lived in that world um but for you guys like what are some things you you can remember from how important the dinner table used to be or how important those moments did used to be without technology and without maybe more distractions than there are now whoever wants to start there um, I would say, honestly, it's interesting for, in my case, I feel like uh, my upbringing looks kind of a lot like, like my family now. Um, we, both my parents worked growing up, and so it was, you know, everybody got home from, from work and school, and it was, let's throw something together really quickly, and then, you know, and then we'll sit down together, like I was saying, then we'll spend the t intentional time together um, at the table. But, but, but growing up, it was, there was a lot of intentionality between ma making sure that we had that time where everybody sat down together. We sat down at the same time. Um, we, started, we started eating at the same time. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, somebody gets a dish and they start eating. A lot of times with my kids, I'm like, all right, just wait till everybody's sitting down, you know, and then we'll pray and then we'll dig in. But, um, but lots of, I think, I think routine um, requires us to create that, that structure. And so for, for me growing up, that's just the way it was. And, it, and it's kind of translated that way. Um, there's a lot of times where um, my wife likes to cook. And so there's a lot of times where I'm like, when she gets home from work and I'm like, why don't you just make something quick and easy? Like, that's the way that my parents did it. You know, we're okay. We were okay eating, you know, freezer food all the time, you know? So like, but she, she likes that. Um, that's how she, I feel like she shows love to our family a lot of times by creating those meals. So, um, but I, I would say to answer that question, yeah, for us and my family, it, it, it's translated almost exactly from what it looked like when I was growing up. So I say it's a lot different than it was when I grew up. My mom was a great cook and she still is, but she, um, had a routine and it would be every day. I think it would be like a, almost a set time, like either five or 5.30 was dinner time. And it's just my mom and dad and my sister and I, and it was a traditional dinner. She would cook from scratch. I mean, it was like probably six out of seven nights of the week was the same like that we could expect it. It was always, always good, always meat, always a vegetable, always a bread. It was like, you know, this, what you might expect. And, but I remember some of the ones I remember the most was one of my favorites was when we would do fondue. And you'd have all the, like the raw meats and then the, the oil, you would cook it in, but it took longer, but you spend more time talking, not just with the four of us, but like sometimes with extended family or friends. And those are some of the memories that really stand out to me because it wasn't a rush. It was never a rush. It was never like, and I think too, so many of us have experienced this with the way schedules are today. Sports, we had them back then, but it wasn't near as intrusive into our schedules of like every night we're going to a baseball field it feels like or we have something at 5 to 7 p.m. it was always after dinner or it just worked out differently it didn't feel at all like it does today yeah. 
my, mine was a little different. I had three, there's two, three of us, so a sister nine years older, four years older, and my dad cooked mostly, and we were bad. So we were like throwing food at each other. I mean, I'm picky, and my mom would be like, you're sitting at that table till you eat everything. And so four hours later, probably 15 minutes later, I was still like, I don't want to eat it. So um, I just remember it being kind of hectic and chaotic, but ironically, when I had kids, I was like, we are going to sit down as a family and have dinner every night at the d table. Like, we never ate in front of the TV. And when I was growing up, we ate in front of the TV a lot. But we didn't do that. And we couldn't have phones. And, you know, Brock played a lot of sports. But sometimes we ate dinner at 4 o'clock if that's what we had to do. But it was just important for me, for all of us to sit down and eat together. And not because I was scarred by growing up and being bad, but just because I knew it was important. And I felt like it was such a good time to connect when you're so busy and so crazy. You at least had that little bit of time where you could say, what, what, tell me something good that happened in your day today. Yeah, for me, um, you know, I'm one of six siblings, and so to get all, you know, seven, eight of us, depending on seasons of life, at the table together was just tricky. And so, you know, my, I know my parents would always try like one or, one or two nights a week if we can all sit down and eat together. You know, that was enough because it was just so many different schedules. And, and I mean, a lot of you are nodding your heads because you know what it's like. There's just so many things to manage. And, uh, you know, week to week doesn't always look the same. But the, the times that we would sit down together at, you know, face to face at the table, like I can vividly remember, um, you know, my dad kind of asking the same kind of questions of, you know, best part, worst part of your week or best part, worst part of your, your day. And, um, you're just having these moments where it was like, okay, we're having a home-cooked meal, we're sitting down together, and we're actually enjoying each other's face-to-face, -face, you know, company, and, and I just, I remember those memories, uh, you know, really fondly, um, and, you know, now with a, a eight-month-old, you know, we, you're starting those conversations of what that's going to look like when she, you know, is eating at the table with us and things like that, and kind of valuing some of these things the way that we did growing up, so. Yeah, I think we did better. Sherry and I would probably say when we had all four kids at home, in the earlier stages. Now we just have one who's almost 16. It's like our lives are different and it's just three of us. So we, we don't look at it quite the same way, but there's so many good memories. One bad one, I think I should share because my oldest son is in the service is he's probably like, are you going to confess? You know, one of the things we want to do in our podcast is be vulnerable. And so, um, there was one not so shining moment. Christy reminded me of when she was just talking about trying to make your kids eat everything. And there was some, Zach just didn't like pineapple. And I didn't understand why he wouldn't like pineapple, especially fresh cut pineapple, not out of a can. And one day he was just refusing and I remember so bad that I like took it and like jammed it into his mouth and he was choking. And I think Sherry was probably like, what did I, what is going on, pastor? I mean, so um, it was bad. It was a bad moment as a dad. I had a few others I won't share um, because, you know, sake of time here and I look bad enough. But the truth is, I mean, that whole thing of, you know, you, you know, there's kids in other parts of the world that are starving to death and you're going to throw away your pineapple or whatever it is you don't like. We've all heard that. Maybe we've said it, but. I mean, I, yeah, that, I don't really know how to react to that story. I mean, Zach's right there. I'm so sorry, Zach. I mean, just let me say. He still loves Jesus, and he's okay. Like we have a, yeah, what about doesn't pineapple? Like pineapple. Do, you, do you still hate pineapple? A little scarred? Okay. <laughs> and maybe we all have things like that that we were forced to eat at one point or another, you know, whatever it may be, some kind of vegetable, mm -hmm. uh, maybe cabbage or something like that. You know, cabbage is great, actually, I have to say. I'm a big fan of that. Um, anyway, so um, I don't know how you guys, I want to read something here, but um, you know Jenny Allen. A lot of us know the name Jenny Allen. You've heard that before. Um, and she has a book called Find Your People. And the whole idea of the book is this kind of what we want to talk about today of, you know, getting back to how we're supposed to do community and how we're supposed to do relationships with other people. And she has an entire chapter where she talks about the table, the idea of coming together and breaking bread and being face to face with other people. And, um, you know, she starts talking about this idea that in other cultures outside of America, the meal is in the table is still valued very highly. And so it's actually a lot of, um, you know, Americanized civilization that has watered all of that down. But she, her, her big working idea is that the two reasons why we've dropped this and the two reasons why we just kind of rush by these moments where we could be really intentional with our family and even with our friends, the two things that she identifies is inconvenience and conflict. Um, inconvenience, and we're, we're kind of scared of these two things. We're scared to be inconvenienced because everything is so quick, everything is so easy, everything is so fast, so we don't want to take the time to be inconvenienced for the sake of relationship, but also um, we're really scared of conflict. We're scared of, you know, if I really let somebody in, 
um, you know, to my home and I prepare them a meal and I do these things, there's going to be inevitably a moment where I have conflict, conflict with them and I don't know how to deal with that and I don't know how to process it. And so those are kind of her two big things that she believes this is why we've kind of gotten away from, um, you know, intentional relationships with other people. Um, and so I kind of want to break down the two of the, those, if that's okay with everybody here. Um, but it, maybe some initial thoughts, quick thoughts on if you guys think she's right, if you think she's way off, if there's a third one that you would add. Um, inconvenience and conflict are the two reasons she believes why we've gotten away from this table idea. I would throw in um, maybe infamiliarity or being or the, just being uncomfortable with it in general. I think um, for those that know me well, know that I'm pretty introverted, and uh, I don't necessarily love meeting with strangers over dinner. I think. It's, it's so much more comfortable, obviously, when the conversation is, is deeper than like, hey, Mitch, I love your shirt, I, I love your pants, or the w weather's great today. Um, but if you're able to sit down and have an intentional conversation that you already going into it know that you're going to be comfortable with, I think that's the third one that I would, I would add to that. But. Yeah, do you love his shoes? <laughs> I'm, I'm not a shoe guy, so. Because shoes are overrated. So anyway, I got mine done. <laughs> <sighs> I didn't know we were announcing it. No, mine was not. Cabbage is Great, so oh, I, I got okay. that one too. That makes more sense. Mine was I Love Your Pants. Aww. Christy, you haven't done it yet? No. Okay, <laughs> we'll get there. All right. Yeah, no, I think that's a good one to add, um, you know, kind of unfamiliarity, what, what's it going to be like. Um, and I would add that to inconvenience a little bit maybe, kind of group those together of just I'm, I'm a little bit scared to be inconvenienced with, you know, meeting someone new or getting past the surface level a little bit. So let's start there on the inconvenience side. Um, what is the most inconvenient part about um, spending time with people intentionally? What do you guys think? I think if, you, if you're hosting somebody, there's the whole preparation um, some people might be more in that mindset of my house has to be perfectly clean to have people over, especially when it's somebody new, making a good first impression. The stress of, well, you know, where do they want, if, we, if we're having over, what food do they not like, you know, or where do we decide to suggest to go to eat? There's so many things that, you know, that could come up. So it's inconvenient to try to figure all that out. And so sometimes I think we withdraw and just, we don't do what we should. We don't. And I think, you know, it's a, it, like you said, Mitch, it's an American culture problem that we don't do it like we should. I think like the timing, it's a big time commitment to have people over and cook for them. Like um, hosting doesn't stress me out. You can come to my house anytime and I'll let you in. Um, but the whole in, like inconvenience of the time, it's, and everyone's so busy that when I do, I've done this to several of you, they're my friends, I'll be like, okay, here's seven dates in October that we have open. Do any of those work for you? Because it's hard just to even get something on the calendar to schedule something like that. Yeah. I'll add to I'll add to that. For our family, we we eat like super early at five o'clock, which some people most people aren't even home from work by five o'clock. But like if we're not eating at five o'clock, our three kids are running around with their hair on fire, like like screaming for food. Um, and so for and the inconvenience factor for us, having people over is like, oh, okay, you guys can come over for dinner, but we're eating at five. So that means you need to be there at 4.30 and then you need to be out of my house by like 6.30, so. And it's so uh, unfamiliar that you're like, does someone want to come to my house and eat dinner? And where's the end time? Like, okay, so if you come over at six, like you could stay at my house till midnight, it wouldn't bother me. But other people may be like, um, when's the end time? Like, is it eight? Amen. Like, like Jared, is it, you know, you come over at five, five, 15, you should be out of the house. Like, what is that? I think that's like just so unfamiliar that we're not used to just hanging out and like coming over to someone's house and just sitting and talking. There has to be a purpose and a reason and I digress. You know, that, I think that's really good. I think, um, yeah, we're, I think maybe a lot of us assume too much of the other people. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, if we're going to extend the invitation and we're going to try to have somebody over or do something with somebody, we run through 500 questions of, you know, what if I'm too much? What if this, what if they don't like the food? What if, you know, my house isn't clean enough? What if whatever? And we're almost like projecting too much onto the people that maybe just want to spend time with us. And just the fact that we're inviting them over is enough, right? Um, and I think maybe that stops us from 
um, even doing some of these things because we, we've already spelled out everything that this, these people could do. Um, and then we're just like, oh, I won't send the invitation. I don't want to be a burden. They've got too much going on. And then we just don't do it. Um, and I don't, think, I don't think that's a good approach. <laughs> um, so inconvenience, yeah, I, I think in, in reality, loving people and having good relationships is inconvenient. And, and that's okay. Um, I think w- our world tells us if something's inconvenient, if something's hard, if something takes effort or work, then it's probably just step away from it. It's not worth it, right? Um, but real relationships and the best relationships that you have, think about your marriages. Think about with your kids. Like, it is inconvenient, and it does take work, and it does take effort, and that's what makes it good, right? Um, and so um, maybe as we, we'll move into conflict here in a second, but... Um, what are maybe some ways or some, some real takeaways that we could all have to be more inconvenienced for the sake of relationships? How can we get better at maybe thinking about our time a little bit uh, and being more willing to give some of that away for the sake of other people? I think if you, I mean, you look at last week's sermon and the, with the Passover, the fa- Passover meal that was happening and, you know, Jesus knew all that was going to be happening, you know, the next, that night and the next day. Um, but he wouldn't let anything come between that and having a meal with, with his disciples. And I think that moving our intentional time with people up on our priority list and getting, you know, pushing all the other junk to the side is, I mean, it's obviously it's way easier said than done for most of us that live uh, busy lifestyles. But, um, but I think that we can take that takeaway, you know, from last week's sermon. Yeah. I think not letting something come between us and a plan that we made, we make a plan. That's, that's the first step, but also uh, not being quick to cancel something when, you know, like even if it's inconvenient, uh, finding ways to, 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 to do it either way. I, and then sometimes here, like on staff, we'll go out to lunch at least once a week together. And there's sometimes I'm just like, oh, I got these other things to do. But sometimes even with all the things on my to-do list, I'm like, this matters. This relationships matter. And I don't want to miss that. Um, also, I have FOMO. So, I, you know, I don't want to miss out on anything. Um, they'll probably talk about me if I'm not there. So, I'm, uh, so anyway, no, serious, it's true, isn't it? Um, but I, I think that just being intentional, yeah, it's, it's, it's a way to overcome inconvenience. And it's just important. I think our relationships are so surfacy nowadays because we do spend like the 10 minutes together. And um, think about when you're growing up and you are, have like best friends, and especially girls, probably more than boys, you spent the night. You had no plans. You didn't have an agenda. You just hung out and talked and got to know each other. Now, can't really do that now. I couldn't be like, hey, Maggie, you want to come spend the night? That might be weird. But um, still, taking the time to get to know each other, and if you know me very well, I know you guys do, I love asking like hard, weird, deep questions. I even have a book that's like, I don't know, 4,000 questions about <laughs> about me. So I love just getting to really know someone, and I feel like that's kind of a lost art. Yeah. And it, I think playing off of what, something you said earlier about just like throwing out dates to people. Hey, here's eight dates. Pick one, and we'll make it work. Um, you know, if something, I, I, we've actually started doing that because you guys are so good at that. You and Terry are awesome at that. And um, like, you know, if somebody, if something does fall through because life happens or plans have to change, don't just be like, oh, okay, and then put it off, and then you know, it goes by two months and you haven't seen that person. Maybe respond to if something gets canceled or something changed with, okay, hey, let's make it work. Here's eight dates, or here's some other times that might work. Like, just be intentional about because if you don't schedule it, <laughs> if you don't make time for it, you will go months and months and months without this time. That that really does matter with other people and you'll, you'll blink and be like, man, I haven't hung out with them and, and however long, you know? And that hurts friendships because then people think like, oh, they haven't answered me. They must not want to hang out with me. Therefore, I'm done trying where it may not be the case at all with the other person. It may be, but it may not be the case at all. Yeah. Um, some friends of, our re- friends of ours recently were evaluating priorities and things that they were committed to in their life and they said the question they keep asking each other is whose time is it anyway? So they keep asking each other this question of, you know, we're living on borrowed time. Uh, There's only so much time that we have before Jesus comes back or we die or whatever it may be. And so this question of kind of, yeah, I want to be selfish and keep it to myself and I want to relax and do nothing, which there's a time and place for that. But, um, you know, this kind of question of, well, whose time is it anyway, right? It's not not only my time. I, I have these people in my life that I'm supposed to invest in and love and care for and serve and prepare meals for and do these things. And so, you know, as you're evaluating your week or your month, I think that question of, well, whose time really is it? Ultimately, it's God's time. God has given us, you know, the breath in our lungs for today. And so, you know, how can we better, you know, work some of that out, I think is helpful. I think an easy way um, to apply some of this 
and our, our, my family needs some work. I think that eating dinners with, with uh, people more often would, it's uncomfortable for me as an introvert, but something that obviously we're talking about the value in. But, um, but our family, um, we, we go to eat Mexican every single Friday night. Like that's our, that's our thing. Those, those of you that um, know me know that, know that that's true. At five o'clock, by the way. And, <laughs> But we always tell people, like, it's basically an open invite, you know, for us. We have people join us all the time. I think all, all of y'all have joined us, and a lot of you guys have been, been with us. And, I mean, we don't own the restaurants. Tell so them the restaurants are the open. Yeah, hey, you can ask me later. It's, uh, but, uh, but maybe that's something that you can, you can do in your life, have an intentional night of the week that's like, this is our night to, to if, if nobody's joining us, then it's just our family. It's still an intentional time uh, together, so. Let's, um, for the, we got a couple more minutes. I don't want to take too long. Let's move on to conflict a little bit. Um, I think, uh, you know, Jenny Allen kind of states this, but I think it's really true. I think a lot of us are scared of conflict. We're scared that we're going to run into that at some point. And so often we don't go deep and we don't go past the surface because we're so scared on what's on, what's on, on the other side of that. And so maybe for just a couple minutes, we'll kind of riff on that of uh, why is conflict needed? Why is it necessary? What are healthy ways that you can approach it? Even with friends, um, and, and, you know, because I think that's going to allow us to get better at this whole community idea that we're talking about. So um, any, if anybody has any initial thoughts there, go for it. Um, but just for a couple minutes, let's talk about how to actually handle conflict well. I guess I never thought about conflict in this, like, meals and hanging out. When you said that, I was like, oh, I, that's not something I'm afraid of. Do you have of. meals that turn into conflict? I don't think so. And that's what you're talking about right that's what jenny was talking about i mean if you go past the surface there are going you know you ask bigger questions you have you know what do you think about this how you feel about this there's going to be times when you run don't into agree. some kind of conflict yeah. maybe yeah I, it's funny because i read a verse this morning just trying to think about today and solomon said in proverbs 15 said, i think this is funny a bowl of vegetables with someone you love is better than steak with someone you hate what do you think no <laughs> i knew you would say no it's like, it's like, I think though the point is that we don't, like to your point earlier, is we don't want to schedule times with people that we think might turn into conflict. Is that yeah. part of the problem? Yeah. yeah, so maybe we should. You can have conflict if I don't eat what you make me. <laughs> you have to love me, or like if someone's house doesn't smell good. I mean, I'm not big on smells, but you know. Right. I couldn't do it, it was my card. <laughs> I'm not big on smells. I'm not big on smells. <laughs> Wow. Hey, I'm that so fits you. about that, the whole service. That's all you've been thinking about is that card. <laughs> she has the best smelling office so sorry, in the church. I don't like you. Yeah. You didn't, well, anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I think the point she's making, maybe conflict is a bad word for it because we get, you know, a bad taste in our mouth when we hear the word conflict, but, um, you know, when you actually do life with another human being you are going to disagree at some point if you're actually past the surface with that person right um you know think about any relationship that actually has value you don't just agree on everything there's times when you're like oh you feel that way or you 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 think this and and or you were raised that way that's different for me and and being able to conversate not be scared of that but being able to you know go past the surface and be like hey let's talk about some of the stuff maybe we, we don't agree on or talk about some of the stuff that, that we see differently, that is helpful. That's actually a good thing for the sake of relationships that last. Um, you know, you're going to make time and actually schedule and be intentional with relationships that challenge you and shape you and aren't just like, so how, how was your day? Good. How was yours? Good. Yeah, but having read that book, they go deep in there. If anyone else read that book, like they sit down and say, all right, you guys, let's put our finances out here, and I'm gonna hold you accountable for something. Like, she, she goes that level deep yeah. in, in the book. So that's like a whole nother universe beyond my deep. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this, and, and both of those things together, intentionality or inconvenience and conflict. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at a conference in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I was driving back from myself, by myself, about six and a half hour drive, and I had um, texted a friend, well, he was my best friend from my, in my 20s, and he lives in Charleston, West Virginia. And sadly, he's lived there for like 15 years and we, we've never gotten together. I've, in like seven or eight years, I haven't seen him. And I texted him, he said, are you, you're driving back home? You're gonna come right past where I live. And I'm like, that's true. And he's like, why don't we meet for lunch? And I was like, thinking about my drive and getting home before dark and things I had to do and the, the timing of it. And I was like, okay. So we met at Cracker Barrel at two o'clock for a late lunch and I was there till about 4.30 and two and a half hours of catching up. It wasn't convenient and it, it was awesome. It was so good. 
Also, though, there's, he and I always had conflict, and he was my best friend because we did not agree on everything, and I had to, we always had that, like, uh, that tension, but it was a good tension, and we appreciated each other, we loved each other, and we helped each other grow in our faith, and that was what's most important. So I think to what you're talking about, Mitch, I, and what Jenny was saying in that book, it's like so important that we don't just think, well, I have my meals with all these people that make me feel better about myself as I am and don't challenge me in life. We need people that challenge us. And the first step is building that relationship because then you know, like, if you're having conflict with me or, you know, someone, a good friend of yours, that's coming out of love, not out of just trying to be mean or tear you down. So if you take the time and have the dinners to build the relationship, so then you're more able to have healthy conflict and you know that person's coming from a place of love. Yeah, I mean, it's what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 27, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend, right? Um, you know, iron sharpening iron, there's this friction, there's this tension, there's this, we're both going to get better. Um, and that probably isn't going to always feel good, um, but it's worth it in the end, right? And I think that's kind of maybe some of the points we're making. So I know Steve didn't really know where this conversation was fully going to go this morning, but I did ask that he would close us out today um, for this service and just kind of give us a couple things to take away. So that's yeah, a lot to think about you guys have been awesome listening to you guys talk and you know just we we know from looking in the bible i mean the food is mentioned more than 1200 times in the bible meals matter and god created us like uh, we talked about this week uh, a little bit about this is that the very beginning in genesis i mean right away god says here's the fruit for you guys to eat and then one day we have the last thing the bible talks about is the marriage supper of the lamb uh with jesus so it's like it's all through the Bible, and we, in the series, talked about Jesus even being like a caterer. You know, we didn't really say that until now, but, I mean, he was at a wedding, and they ran out of wine, and he, he just made all the guests happy, and one miracle is first. And then the miracle of the fishes and the loaves, where he fed thousands of people at one time. I mean, Jesus, over and over again, uh, gives us this great example. We can't do those things. We can't make uh, do miracles but like that but we can take the meals that we have in our lives and not waste them and i think that is where i've been uh, thinking about a lot this week uh, is this whole idea of god created us with the need for food i mean we all know we need food I and mean, it's throughout the bible but we don't have to be told to eat like you know like mitch is talking about his baby girl i mean like you don't have to tell them to eat i mean right away they, they they're born with the need to eat and they know that um, but I think gathering around the table uh, has a physical purpose, but it provides a landscape for community. And I think that we miss that by what like we talked about early in the, in the talk about rushing through life, being inconvenienced. And I think if anything that we can take away from this message, from this talk, from this podcast, it's about being willing to be inconvenienced. Being on mission for Jesus means being inconvenienced in a lot of areas of our lives and why not utilize something we have to do <laughs> we have to eat that's part of it why why not utilize that more in a way that creates um, an opportunity like you know taking a relationship deeper meeting someone like we talked about for the first time and over a meal where we can really get to know them being generous it is it does cost right i mean like groceries expensive taking somebody out to eat expensive um, when you have a family, having teachable moments, not letting them go by. Um, all those things I think are so important. So there's so many things we could talk about in this whole arena of food because God established it. But I think the, the, the bottom line, if you hear anything, is be on mission with your meals. Like just don't waste a meal. I mean, that doesn't mean don't waste it, throw it in the trash. Don't waste a meal as an opportunity to do something that will honor and glorify God. Because I'll close with this one verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. So let's pray together. God, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share, just to have this conversation with my friends in front of our church. Lord, I just thank you so much for, for our staff and for the, the way they, they pour into their jobs and into their ministry, but pour into each other. And Lord, we just are thankful for friendships. And Lord, everyone in this room, God, needs food, but we also need friendship. We need uh, the nourishment that comes from relationship. And Lord, help us, whether it's with a spouse, with family, with friends, with coworkers, uh, with people we're trying to reach for Jesus. Lord, help us to make the most of every meal. Lord, help us to think about the impact that we can make by just giving more of ourselves, being inconvenienced, being willing to have conflict. 
And Lord, we just thank you so much for what we can learn practically from your word and from what you did. Now help us to put it into practice in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the In All Things podcast. Our challenge for you today is to send this episode to one person. Seriously, think of somebody right now that could use this conversation and send it to them. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic ideas, please send them to podcast at sycamorecreek.org. And make sure you follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Sycamore Creek Church so that you can always see what's going on in our world. If this conversation helped you at all, make sure you share it, leave a review, and subscribe so that you don't miss out on a single episode. We love you. God loves you. And we'll see you next week on the In All Things podcast.